Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here at this uh, AQC conference. Um, I must thank the organizer for the very kind invitation. Okay, I will um, talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, some recent twist of quantum annealing that we adventured in um, with connections to uh, digitalization, quantum control, and uh, uh, this uh, recent hybrid quantum variational schemes that uh, Ed Fari has uh, introduced, okay? So, the um, story is, in fact, contained in a recent archive, which uh, appeared on Monday. Uh, there, the co-authors are Rosario Fazio in Trieste ICTP, and Glenn, who is a CISA PhD student, who is probably sitting, maybe sitting here, maybe, oh yes, he is there, okay. <laughs> The story is also partly uh, telling a poster today. And, uh, well, Glenn is, by the way, sorry, looking for postdoc. So, you know, I mean, just in case. There he is. Okay. Um, uh, okay, let's go on. Let me explain the uh, long title in a kind of, I mean, one slide story. Okay. Uh, I don't have to really tell you about uh, QA, AQC. Uh, just to set the notation, you have some uh, driver Hamiltonian, usually the transverse field, uh, some initial state that is just the all spin allowed, aligned along x. You want to drive uh, your Hamiltonian to end up with a given problem Hamiltonian Hz with a certain schedule hmm, in a certain total annealing time tau, and you follow some Schrodinger evolution. Hmm. The goal is given a certain schedule, often a linear schedule, but not necessarily, to somehow minimize your expectation value of the problem Hamiltonian. So somehow the keywords here are adiabaticity, what type of gap you will encounter through the evolutions, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, in this uh, new scheme that is called QAOA, Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, it has, in fact, different names. People call it also variational, quantum, classical uh, simulation, and th things like this. Uh, there are different variants, but never mind. You just take the two Hamiltonians, say Hx and Hz, hmm? and then you apply them unitaries made of e to the minus Hz times some parameter gamma 1, e to the minus Hx times some parameter beta 1, and so on and so forth. Alternatively, you apply P times the HZ, P times the uh, HX. So you have a total of two P variational parameters, the gammas and the betas, that somehow uh, allow you to reconstruct a variational state. Huh? Then you calculate your problem Hamiltonian expectation value on those state, hmm? on the state, as a function of the parameters. You run a classical computer to find the best parameters, so you do some minimization, and you hope to construct a, a good state for your system. Okay, so here the keyword is obviously a variational optimization. You know nothing about gaps and things in principle, right? Okay, obviously, uh, if I take this problem and I trotter digitize, okay, so I split my evolution into steps, and then I just split Hx and Hz, you realize uh, almost immediately that what you get is essentially a, an evolution that is of this form. So this is kind of a trotter type of uh, uh, evolution in, in this guise with parameters rather than time and Hamiltonian uh, couplings. Okay? So in some sense, this is uh, a, a larger set of possibilities with these parameters that you give yourself, rather than just starting from here and trotter digitizing. So in some sense, what you, I'm saying is that the QAOA uh, ansatz, so this ansatz is a kind of larger uh, set on which the digital QA, so if you trotter digitize your QA, you would be just in a subset of this. Okay, this is a, a kind of trivial statement. Okay. Now, there's a, a, another aspect of the story that is optimal control. So, in that, in that game, the uh, idea is given some initial state, okay, what target states are reachable in the Hilbert space given enough time? So, 
what is the, for instance, the shortest time that I need to invest to reach some target state? What is the protocol that best uh, achieves that uh, um, target state, if I can, obviously, in the best optimal way? Kind of questions like this, okay? So in this frame, for instance, you might ask, what is the best schedule parameter that I have to uh, um, uh, design uh, to, uh, to, to get, to, get uh, to the lowest residual energy in my quantum annealing thing? And here, the surprising result is that the best protocol is not a smooth, gentle thing passing through the critical point. It's rather a so-called bang, bang, oops, sorry, bang, bang um, um, uh, schedule. So you do some, uh, for a certain time, some s equal one, then some s equal zero, then you oscillate in between the region of variability of your parameter in a rather uh, abrupt way. Uh, this is a theorem, comes from Pontryagin theorem in control theory, okay? And is contained in this paper here by Shamon. Hmm? Uh, now, this in principle, sorry, uh, tells um, that the optimal solutions, okay, uh, are in this set of states that QAOA describes. These are the stars. There could be more than one optimal solution in principle, okay? Uh, what about adiabaticity and, uh, well, the essence of the story that I will tell you is that, in fact, you can construct solutions that are also quantum annealing solutions, okay? They are as good, for the problem we will see, as good as the other, in fact, totally degenerate, okay? So, in some sense, this puts an arrow in this direction. So, you can find optimal solutions that are also digital quantum annealing solutions, and uh, the, uh, obviously, the model on which I will show you this is a very, I mean, is the standard model for us. So, the transfer field easing model. How general this is, uh, it's still underway. We will discuss at the end some um, issues about this. Okay? So, that's the uh, story in the title. Okay? So, let me now go to a brief outline. So, I will just briefly sketch again to set the notation QA, QAOA control, hmm? uh, then I will uh, tell you the problem on which we have uh, uh, studied this thing. It's called Max Cat, if you want to make it pompous, but really, in our case, it's just the antiferromagnetic easing chain. So it's a very, very simple problem. I will show you that you can actually devise a rigorous bound on the residual energy, okay, given the number of steps P of your digital evolution. And then I will show you some Jordan Wigner result that really confirmed that the bound can be attained. Uh, and then I will show you how you can construct, in fact, optimal solutions that are really adiabatic. So they are somehow digital quantum annealing. Okay? Uh, this vindicates, in some sense, quantum annealing, which uh, uh, has, has, a, has a bridge to this uh, new um, technique. Now, and, and then some conclusion. Okay, so quantum annealing needs no introduction uh, for you, but just to set the notation, so the driver's field, I will call it HX, then in general, you can generalize, obviously, but let me just talk about two, uh, the problem Hamiltonian and the driver field and some interpolation parameter S in the standard way. Uh, the general unitary Schrodinger evolution would be a time order Exponential, you can think of any shape uh, of uh, the schedule parameter S of t given some total annealing time tau. Mm? And this I would call it continuous time QA. Mm? Now, the usual, by the way, the usual, one usual choice, if you know nothing better, is a, a, a linear annealing schedule. Mm? Now, and in principle, uh, you, you, you uh, want to monitor what is the uh, uh, average expectation value of your problem Hamiltonian on the final state of your evolution. Now, in preparation for more digital uh, stories, uh, can, you can certainly uh, step, uh, discretize your uh, evolution. This is a rather um, mild thing because, after all, any curve on your screen is always 
made by pixels. So, I mean, think of just steps uh, there. Okay, for instance, here I have eight steps. Huh? This I would call it step QA. And the nice thing is that the evolution operator now becomes application of e to the minus some fixed time Hamiltonian with a parameter s of m times some interval delta tm. Okay, good. So this is a step discretization. But indeed, you want to go one step further because you want to really apply gates that are somehow simple to construct in the lab. And this is the proposal that Martinez has put forward, uh, calling it digital QA, so in a recent nature. Huh? So it's essentially take this uh, evolution operator uh, with a fixed Hamiltonian HSM for a time delta Tm and split it into two terms, the Hz and the Hx. Since H is S Hz plus 1 over uh, minus S Hx, you can always do that with an error, okay? And you can calculate the parameters gamma m and beta m, okay, that comes from this lowest order, say, throttle discretization. It's a simple thing, okay? Now, uh, essentially, if you look at this expression, it is like uh, uh, I have some parameter gamma 1, okay, over which the s is uh, 1, and then beta 1 over which the s is 0, because I have only... Uh, uh, hx, and so and so forth, okay? So the parameters are essentially the time lags where s is equal to 1 and the time lags where s is equal to 0, okay? So gamma 1, beta 1, gamma 2, beta 2 are this bang-bang um, type of times that you have. Oops, sorry. Uh, just to insist a little bit, the time is related to the sum of the parameters, beta, the schedule S is related to the ratio of the parameters, and the total annealing time is just the sum of all the gamma M and beta M. So it's proportional to P. So whenever I would say P later on, the number of digital steps, think of the total time, okay? The total annealing time is roughly proportional. Okay, good. Let's move to QAOA. Now, as I told you, it's a larger ansatz that includes this digital QA I have just described, with a freedom on the variational parameters. So you start from your initial state, you apply the first HZ term, and then HX, and so on and so forth, and then you measure uh, the problem Hamiltonian on the final state you have formed, okay? And the go... Oh, by the way, there are enthusiastic views of this approach. Uh, Seth Lloyd, for instance, has posted a, a paper in which it shows that quantum approximate optimization is computational universally, but there are also kind of uh, uh, unhappy views because there are, in fact, uh, I mean, Hastings has uh, shown that you can construct um, smart classical argument that easily uh, can outperform at least low stage um, uh, QAOA things. So the, 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 thing, the thing is open, okay? There are supporters and, and not. Uh, so the goal is to perform optimization on the classical uh, parameters, and obviously then you form a best candidate, gamma star, beta star, and the candidate state. The problem obviously is how much do I have to pay to obtain this minimum, okay? Good, so let's move on. Again, uh, quickly, optimal quantum control, as I told you, is uh, the answer uh, in this case, to the question, let's see, uh, what is the optimal S of T that I should uh, um, uh, devise here to drive my system? And the answer is again, uh, bang, bang, if you really want the optimal. Uh, sorry. Okay, so the solutions are in principle within the ansatz of QAOA. Okay, good. This is the end of my introduction. Sorry, my uh, animation thing is not perfect. Okay, good. The problem. Uh, well, as you know, essentially any, ma many, or if not all, computer science problems can be formulated uh, as some of easing uh, interactions, okay, of different orders, okay? So binary uh, variables. Mm. Uh, the problem I'm discussing is called MaxCat, which is essentially you have a graph, the black nodes, you have some edges, okay? 
and uh, you want to label the nodes with plus one and minus one or black and white in such a way that the number of edges you have to cut to separate the two differently labeled nodes is maximum, okay? So for instance, here is the solution in this case. If you label the thing this way, you have to cut five edges, okay, which is the maximum in this case. Physically, this means find the classical ground state of an anti-ferromagnetic easy model. Generally, however, the lattice is frustrated. There are conflicting requirements, okay? So viewed in this way, in this physical way, obviously you can write the Hamiltonian easily. It is essentially sigma zi, sigma zj minus one, so when it is anti-ferro, this is minus two, you divide by two, you get a minus one, okay? So if you uh, argue for a second, this is minus the number of edges you cut. You want to minimize them, okay? It's called max cut, but we physicists like to minimize things. Okay, good. Okay, so, uh, sorry. Now, special case. It's called the ring of disagrees, if this sounds more... I mean, easier to you. To me, Ising model on a chain is a bit uh, clearer, but uh, this depends on the training somehow. Okay, so here is the special case that I will consider. It's a ring with uh, nearest neighbor links. So it's a simple, unfrustrated problem. The antiferromagnetic is in chain. Okay, so obviously the solution of this is alternating in a held state, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And I will use as driver, as problem Hamiltonian, essentially the same Hamiltonian without this factor two for just technical reason, never mind, okay? So the ground state is extra simple, minus two N is the energy, okay? The maximum uh, energy is obviously if you put a ferromagnetic state, then you get zero, okay? Good. How do I characterize how good is my state? Uh, well, I have this state, I have the expectation value, I introduce what is called the residual energy. So I subtract, sorry, I subtract the minimum energy, which I know how much it is, by the way, and I appropriately rescale with the maximum so that this is somehow not extensive, okay? And in this way, my residual energy will be bounded between zero and one, okay? Zero means I've got the state, the minimum state. One, I'm quite far away from it. In fact, the maximum distance. Okay, by the way, uh, in Fari's paper and in many papers of these things, uh, they prefer to work with one minus this, which is called the approximation ratio. Never mind, it's just a, a simple uh, relationship. Now, the bound that I want to show to you. Sorry. <laughs> Now, let me give you a preview. Since there are a couple of slides with some technical things, which are easily annoying and boring, uh, let me just give you the uh, glimpse of the result. I will show to you that no matter what you do, okay, the residual energy as a function of the parameters uh, gamma and beta is in fact bound to be 1 over 2p plus 2, if 2p is smaller than the size of your chain, and zero if 2p is larger than the size of the chain. This is a bound, okay? So the fact that something is larger than zero doesn't mean that you get to zero, okay? But certainly uh, the bound is meaningful here because it tells that if 2p is less than n, you cannot do better than one over 2p plus two. Hmm? Okay, the, if you argue enough, uh, around the proof, you will notice that the bounds really depends solely on the target state that you look at. So it's totally independent on the driver Hamiltonians that you might think of adding with extra unitaries, okay? So somehow also non-stochastic, whatever, okay? This would not improve the performance. The bound is strict. You don't go beyond that, hmm? which is a kind of uh, uh, nice thing. Then I will show some Jordan Wigner results, since in this case you can actually do the numerics. You can verify that the bounds is in fact strictly satisfied. So you see, if your uh, chain is say 50, up to P equal to 25, you stay on the bound curve, one over two P plus two. If you 
uh, exceed that number, you go to zero. You control perfectly your chain. You get the state. So a finite chain can be controlled. It can be, you can do the unitary CN and, and transform the initial state into the final state. And the same here for 200. Okay? Good. So this is the preview. Now, what's the ingredient in the proof? Let's see if I can give you a glimpse of the proof. So again, in one dimension, although we have extended it to higher dimensional situations. Okay, so take the problem Hamiltonian, the easing chain, again, anti-ferro, but uh, it's not a crucial uh, thing, okay? Uh, there is periodic boundary condition, you see? I have a ring, translational invariance is there. I use it, okay? So if you look at the residual energy, you realize that essentially what you have to measure is Given any bond, doesn't matter, by translational invariant, SZ, SZ, or nearest bond, plus one. Because if this is minus one, you get zero. So if you have the antiferromagnet, okay? So you realize that if this is ferro, on the contrary, you will get one, which is the maximum possible um, residual energy, okay? So this operator here uh, is able to tell you what is the residual energy. Now, since there is... Uh, obviously, the state here, as I told you before, is this uh, sequence of unitaries uh, made by that. Now, there is translational invariance. Therefore, here, I can put whatever bond I want. Let me use bond 5 and 6 for drawing purposes, okay? So what I have to do is to calculate sigma z5, sigma z6, the sequence of unitaries, the dagger of them, and then the state of which I have to average, which is the state with all spins along x. Okay? This is the setting of the calculation. Now, let me just, sorry, uh, look at this central piece. Okay? So this sigma z5, sigma z6, with the unitary on the right and on the left. Good. The unitary, if you look here, is made of uh, e to the minus hx, the transfer field, e to the minus hz, and the reverse there, okay? Let's go on. Let's look at hx. Well, since here I have only 5 and 6, obviously all the flipping spins that do not involve 5 and 6 cancel out with the other ones, okay? Because the only non-commuting terms are sigma x5 and sigma x6, right? So I can actually truncate the whole hx to just two spins. Sigma 5 and sigma 6. Okay? Good. What about the problem Hamiltonian? Well, since here in the middle I have just spin 5 and 6, I can truncate to sigma 4, sigma 5, sigma 5, sigma 6, and sigma 6, sigma 7. It's as simple as that. All the other terms actually completely disappear. Okay? So at the first level of my application, what I have is essentially, if I have those two spins, uh, have gone to having a unitary operator that involves, in fact, these four spins. So the information has spread a little bit from two spins to four, because the Hamilton somehow allows you, by nearest neighbor uh, couplings, okay, to involve the other two spins. Now I have a four-spin chain. Okay, and if I am at this level, I can calculate everything with only those four spins. All the others are never reached, in fact. Okay, good. And I can proceed, so and so forth. Now apply this, and needless to say, I involve two more spins. So three and eight, and so and so forth. Okay? You see that there is a kind of light cone, a spreading of correlations that starting from the bond that I want to measure by applying repeatedly P, I involve, okay? Uh, nicely, the Hamiltonians that I have to consider somehow involve those spins in the light cone only. Hmm? So in some sense, I have a reduced spin chain which has only a number of spins that are 2P plus 2, not N. N could be huge, okay? I only need to consider a reduced spin Hamiltonian that has a finite number of spins related to P. And notice, there is no boundary term in this Hamiltonian. There is never a coupling between this spin and that spin. It never comes, okay? Which means an important thing. So the boundary term is actually absent 
or irrelevant. You can put it, it would not be involved. Uh, now, nicely, so I have a reduced spin chain due to locality mm, and to this spreading of correlation. The boundary term is absent. Now, this is good but bad also because I had the translational invariant problem. Now I have a chain with somehow open boundary condition or, but in fact, I can use this to my advantage. Since it is irrelevant, the boundary condition, I can, in fact, so this would be the, the standard thing that you found, this reduced Hamiltonian, I indicate by calligraphic H. You can add whatever boundary term you want. And in fact, you can add it with PBC, okay, with the plus, or with anti-periodic boundary condition. It doesn't matter. It should make no difference. You might say, but why do you do it? There was no term. Well, because in this way, I can use translational invariance back again, okay? Doing a reduced spin chain calculation with open boundary is a pain because, I mean, you, you have to, you cannot use translational invariance, okay? So let me do it. Uh, the transverse field is obviously uh, the same. Now, I have formed a reduced spin chain state, okay, which involves only those 2p plus 2 spins in the code. And with that, I can form my QAOA state and I can calculate my residual energy. And notice that here I can put any term I want, okay? The result should be the same residual energy. Doesn't really matter. Now comes the proof. First, use translational invariance. So if I want to calculate the expectation value of this operator, all I need to do is to average the full Hamiltonian and divide by the number of uh, terms in the Hamiltonian, which is nice. This is translational invariance that allows me to do that. Next, I put this average, which appears there, and I transform it in terms of H. There it is, okay? So I have to residual energy as the average of the Hamiltonian divided by something plus one. And now, simple variational principle. The average of this Hamiltonian on whatever state you have formed, no matter how ingenious it is, is greater than the ground state of that Hamiltonian by the simple, just textbook, variational principle. Now, what is the ground state of the PBC Hamiltonian? You count it immediately, it's 2, 2p two plus 2, okay? What is the ground state when you have anti-periodic boundary condition? You miss just a 2. It's minus 4 here and minus 2 there because you have frustrated the bond. Okay, good, sorry, uh, the animation thing. So, result, the bound tells me that if I use anti-periodic boundary condition, I have that this term is one over two P plus two. The other bound is trivial, is zero, okay? So, something greater than zero will, is a kind of obvious thing. I mean, I, but this is non-trivial. Since I have that freedom, I use it and I discover that the residual energy cannot be greater than 1 over 2p plus 2, okay? Uh, now, you might ask, okay, but do you find those solutions? How many solutions you find? The answer is a lot, 2 to the p, 2 to the p degenerate solution. Here are the eight solutions in the gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 uh, space if I have P equal 3 and any N greater than 8, okay? Eight solutions, 2 to the P. Uh, these are perfectly degenerate. They have the same residual energy. I um, um, move to N equals 6. Now these are moved a little bit, but still eight solutions in different place. And if I have N less than, uh, uh, less than say, 2P, which means I can actually... Um, uh, somehow control the system, I have a, a continuum of the generate solution even, not even a discrete set. Those solutions respect exactly the bound. So all this are 1 over 2p plus 2, and these are zero energy solutions, okay? You can move your state as you wish, you have perfectly controlled the system, which is finite size, away. okay? Good. So this is the numerics, which shows that the uh, Jordan Wigner data are on the bound and then they drop to zero when you can uh, control the system. You have reached that the cone of spreading correlations 
uh, gets to the full system. So somehow to control a system of a certain size n, I have to need a time for the spreading of correlation to involve all spins. Okay, at that point I can hope to get to the target. Now, let me show you how you construct now among this many, two to the p, uh, the general solution, adiabatic solution. The recipe is, in fact, amazingly simple. So suppose that I, I, I know linear annealing uh, thing, okay? I do my trotter, and I start from parameters that are totally compatible with this trotter discretization of a linear schedule, okay? And I, for instance, I look for p equal 2. So linear annealing plus trotter, and I search a, a local minimum. There is the solutions that I get. They look still linear. They are not exactly linear. They are very close to the initial guess, okay? If you look closely, they are just departed a little bit. These are the optimal solutions that I get for p equal 2 if I start from initial point being my trotter uh, guess. Okay, then I proceed. p equal 4. I interpolate my guess from the p equal 2 things, and I search the local minimum starting from this interpolation guess. That's what you get, okay? Very close to the linear kind of interpolation guess. Then I proceed, p equal 8. Again, I interpolate, I start from there, and I search for the local minimum. There it is. I proceed, and here is the curves that I uh, get, okay? They, you see, they are very smooth, but I didn't have to tell the system, look, here there is a critical point, here, please slow down. It's just the minimum that he's looking for, okay? Notice, if I search for an arbitrary solution, so not a local minimum, but just start randomly, what I get is a noisy thing. I mean, these parameters can be whatever they want. They don't have to be smooth and regular, okay? But if I look for regular solutions, I find them, okay? And I can collapse them. So if I divide t by the total time, Okay, and I rescale also the S appropriately, there is a perfect collapse. So somehow this is the schedule which I can iteratively construct and it is optimal. Okay? So smooth solutions can be constructed and there is, sorry, I mean, this is a very annoying thing, no spectral information that I had to use. Okay? Minimization obviously has to be done. So a, an iterative uh, procedure. Okay. Now, uh, just to quickly, these are adiabatic things. You can verify that if you expand your um, time-evolving state on the instantaneous eigenvector of the unitaries that you have applied, and you check for what is the, how, how, how many states you involve, you calculate some Shannon entropy and you see that it's really uh, neatly uh, it's adiabatic in some sense, okay? Never mind for the details. Now, let's compare these optimal solutions with standard solutions, which you can do on the easing chain. For instance, just the linear annealing. As you know, uh, Zermaga uh, and other people also have shown that in the easing chain, you have a kibble zurek mechanism, okay? And the residual energy goes like one over square root of the time you invest, okay? This is the solution, okay, in continuous time quantum annealing with the linear schedule, and this is the linear digital annealing, so the digitalized things. You see, it's above, okay? So here there is no, in fact, no uh, improvement in doing digital. This is different from what Matthias was telling us uh, last time about simulated quantum annealing, where playing with trotter uh, errors, you can even improve sometimes the quality of your solution. Here, the digitalization is really above, but it's still uh, somehow uh, one over square root of time. Okay, good. So this is almost for free. You do not have to do anything. The schedule is linear and simple. Okay, good. Now you can say, okay, let me improve it. Roland and Surf, okay, in the Grover problem have shown there you have a minimum gap that if you adapt your schedule to the minimum gap, uh, then you improve it. Now, if you try this on the easing case, you do not quite get the full speed up that you expect. You do not go from 
one half to one. I mean, we were surprised, but if you try, you have to optimize for every time the parameters appearing in the schedule. You do all your best, and that's what you get, okay? An improvement, 0, 08 something. This is the digital thing, same slope, a bit above. Now, you can do other things. Barankov and Ponkovnikov have suggested that you should do power law uh, approach to the um, critical point, and if you do it, you get also some uh, uh, similar type of, of things, but the real uh, speed up, you get it if you do this regular uh, digital QA solutions that I have shown to you. I mean, the, this is the slopes, that, uh, the, the S that you get. And this is the 1 over tau, full 1 over tau, finally. Okay? Now, you get a quadratic speed up, you, got, you get an optimal solution, and at variance with this, where you have spectral information that you have to give to your system, here is fully recursive, and you need no optimal information, no spectral information. How much does it cost to get this, you might ask? Okay. Now, computational cost. You know that tau is proportional to p. So let's assume that the computational cost for doing a digital evolution of a certain length p is proportional to p. It's a very reasonable thing, okay? Now, if you do linear annealing, kibble zurek 1 over square root of time means 1 over square root of the computational time. Okay? Good. Let's go on. How many iterations I need to perform to go Ob obtain the optimal solution. Now, if I start from a random point and I search for one of the random optimal solutions, I need to spend p squared things, okay? And this is very bad because the computational time scales with the number of iterations times p, so with p cube, which means that p is really the square, the cubic root of the computational time. So, although I got one over p, which is the speed up, in terms of computational time, is one over computational time to the power of one third. It's worse. Okay? So no need to improve your solution if to obtain your improved solution, you have to spend so much. Okay? Good. What about if you start iteratively, as I explained to you, and you construct a digital QA smooth solution? Well, then the number of iterations that you have to do goes with square root of P. Okay? At that point, uh, the, somehow, the, the total computational cost is p to the 3 half, and if you do a little calculation, you understand that you do not have a full speed up, but still you have an improvement. Okay? t to the minus 2 thirds rather than 1 half. Okay? Not 1, but 2 thirds is better than nothing. Okay? So, message always find for smart ways to optimize. Do not go uh, brute force and try to just go, um, okay, let me just finish. Um, open issues. How special is all this? Uh, what is the role of non-stochasticity? Well, we have some results in higher dimension and for ground state preparation that tells that some of this, at least for the bound part, is, can be generalized, okay? Uh, what is the role of disorder? All this use translational invariance. Blah, blah. Well, disorder is nasty. The solutions were all the, totally degenerate minima. As you put this order, the minima become non-degenerate and the landscape becomes a nightmare. Okay? So the landscape of QAOA parameter can become very complex if you have this order. What is the role of locality? In this guise, I used Lib Robinson type of uh, ideas. So the spreading of information, blah, blah, blah. In particular, we are trying to test what happens on fully connected uh, problems where this locality is not there, okay? So, summary, I explained to you that you can construct optimal digital quantum annealing solutions which somehow respect the QAOA answers but are actually, in fact, better in, in computational cost. I have explained to you how to construct variational bounds uh, where locality and boundary conditions play a nice role, and there is no spectral information needed in this optimization, and there is some speed up, okay? And this is the schedule that we have obtained. And with that, I would thank you, and I end my discussion here. Thank you.
Um, it's working. So um, it's a comment and yeah. a question. Yeah. So I wonder whether you're um, uh, about the QAOA on uh, on 1D antifer magnetic ring work. I wonder if you're aware of, um, I had a paper in 2017 on archive, along with my colleagues in NASA. Uh, we looked at exactly the same problem yeah. and got the, uh, the exactly the, same exactly the, uh, <laughs> the bounds um, yeah. through um, the jordan wigman transformation to, so there we got, um, uh, I think, um, a bit more intuitive picture of what's um, going on in the, if we do jordan wigman transformation, um, the dynamics of the 1D um, ring, yeah. collective dynamics, becomes um, uncorrelated, just independent um, qubits dynamics, but collective yeah. control. Yeah. So um, yeah. there, we were able to get the same um, bounds on, say, beyond um, 2P plus 2, the same are the same below that. It's, control, it's controllable. Um, what I uh, we failed to um, further improve, uh, further prove was that the real controllability, meaning we know where the what the um, limit is, but whether it's reachable. We know numerically it's reachable. So I wonder, do you have analytical results on? Um, we know there's solutions that, that gets the best um, um, the the best uh, residual energy, but do you have analytical results on what are the solutions? Uh, first of all, I think I know uh, your paper, and we have uh, honestly quoted it. Uh, uh, if you look in the archive, it's, uh, it's one of the papers we have uh, looked at, and uh, we, we, we agree. Uh, the, uh, we have done numerics on Jordan Wigner for larger chains, uh, up to 200 or so, but uh, the result is, uh, in a sense... Now, uh, the variational bounds with this streak of uh, uh, boundary condition, the spreading of information, I think it's something worth noticing. Uh, it's true. In the Jordan Wigner uh, particular case, you can reduce yourself to independent pseudo spins for each k, mm, and there you see explicitly what is the uh, transformation you have to do on those spins to actually perform the, the thing. Yeah. So I, I think I think we essentially totally agree. I do not know the exact answer to the technical okay. question, but uh, certainly. There is the guy, okay. He will be in front of a poster, and maybe, maybe we can settle. Yeah, we can, we can the thing. talk because okay. um, um, what we found really hard is the um, proof of the controllability there. Okay. Um, yeah. Which. Oh, that would be great. I like yeah, to talk yeah. further. There is an explicit schedule that shows the control. All right. Sounds but I mean, details are kind of here. <laughs> Uh, do you have intuition on the non-adiabatic optimal schedules? Uh, no. So, any no. pattern that you've seen? Random patterns. They are all equivalent. We can just do this. Ta, ta, okay. Ta, ta, so there's ta. no other non-adiabatic principle that you see. No in principle. My, okay. <laughs> just a minimum there. Okay. They are, in fact, in this case, degenerate. In general, they will not be degenerate. So some of them are uh, presumably better, some are worse. Maybe you can construct always digital optimal thing. Will they be better than the best crazy thing? I don't know. So I'm wondering how pathological some of this is. Um, for instance, I saw a plot of the discretization of the annealing schedule, so S versus T, we'll say. Um, it looked like as you were adding points to it, you could just see it was increasingly just giving you a sigmoid that happens to flatten out near S equals 0 0.5, which happens to be the critical point for a 1D ring. It is. Yeah. Yes. So if I gave you a problem that was not a 1D ring, uh -huh. Will still give you that flat point right S of 0 0.5? I did not uh, tell my uh, minimum search routine, look, one half is special, please. I just started from linear, interpolate, look, interpolate, and you yep. discover that there is. If you move this and you are able to do the, the calculation, I think you would spot what is the 
best solution, even if you Because in some ways what you're claiming though is your calculation is finding the critical point. A kind of, kind of. Yeah. So yeah. now you have a method for calculating critical points well, in complex I mean, systems, I wouldn't, I wouldn't which sounds very big. I mean, I'm not saying that all I explain and visualize for you on the easing chain can be exported to any problem you want. But certainly the idea that among the many possible conceivable solutions of QAOA that you should uh, look for, digital quantum, and, I mean, this is a way of somehow resurrecting a, 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 a crosstalk between the, uh, this, this two Sure, yeah, things. I understand that. So well, yeah. I'm, I'm not claiming that this is incredibly general to spot ground uh, critical points of generic Hamiltonian, but certainly I didn't have to suggest to my uh, solutions to go there and flatten there. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see this applied to something else and see where things land up. <laughs> so I hope you're working on that. The easy one is not the universe. Absolutely. You start with the easy one first. I'm full <laughs> on with that. All right. Thank you.